Greetings in Christ. I'm Pastor John Fritz, and I'd like to welcome you to Hope Evangelical Lutheran Church of Aurora, Illinois' worship service for this, the 15th Sunday after Pentecost. The theme for our service and sermon this morning is, You'll Hate the Math Until You Love Your Savior. Please join me as we praise God in the words of the opening song, Lord Have Mercy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear God, we confess to you all our sins and iniquities with which we have ever offended you through our thoughts, words, actions, and failures to act. We are truly sorry for them and want to stop doing them. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Remember our sins no more for Christ's sake, and move us to share your mercy with our world. Amen. Almighty God chose to place the world's sins on Jesus so that we and all who trust in him could receive salvation in his name. On the basis of this, your confession as a called and ordained servant of the word, I absolve you of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We respond to God's absolution of our sins by joining in singing, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Oh 
the psalm for today is Psalm 103, verses 1 through 12. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Our Old Testament lesson is Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will t hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is Romans 14 verses 1 through 12. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld. For the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. This is the word of the Lord. 
The Holy Gospel is recorded in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went out and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt, because you pleaded with me, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant, as I had mercy on you. And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers, until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please join me as we praise God in the words of the sermon song, Living Hope. King of kings call 
promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the theme for our sermon this morning is you'll hate the math until you love your Savior. It seems that some people are born just loving mathematics, other people not so much. One of my Facebook friends is a math teacher and she rejoices when her students get it and the little light bulb switches on and they've shown that they've not only learned some very base things about numbers but actually enjoy how mathematics works and how equations balance out and how there is a certainty in knowing how numbers can be ordered together and used to help explain our world. There are a number of different lessons that we learn from the scriptures for today. Many people love the 23rd Psalm as their favorite Psalm, but the Psalm for today has great treasure in it. And I would encourage you to go through and reread it and perhaps memorize it as well. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. There we have the concept, the mathematical concept of infinity. The Old Testament lesson has Joseph. Remember Joseph, inspired by God, the Holy Spirit, to have visions and dream dreams. Unfortunately, his parents had very, very obvious favoritism that they shared in their family, and his brothers learned to despise him. In fact, his brothers plotted and planned to kill him until they did the math and they found out, you know, if we kill him, we get nothing. If we sell him, to the Midianite slash Ishmaelite traders into slavery, then we'll get 30 pieces of silver, price of a slave. What a deal. So they did the math and they got rid of their problematic, annoying teenage brother who was their daddy's favorite. And Joseph was sold into slavery when their father died, 
their circumstances had all greatly changed. Joseph had become, again, through the power of the Holy Spirit, a great leader in Egypt, and he was in a position of power and authority, and he still had his cognitive abilities hanging around. He remembered what his brothers did to him. The brothers remembered as well, and when their dad died, they decided to lie to their brother and say, on top of all the other evil we've done to you, we're going to make up this lie that our dad said you shouldn't hurt us because we don't trust that you're not going to take revenge on us for conspiracy to commit your murder and then selling you off into horrible slavery where you honored God, you refused the sexual temptation of Potiphar's wife, and for that you were punished as well, and you succeeded in all of your responsibilities, even in jail, and the servant of Pharaoh that was supposed to remember you forgot you for years until it was time to point out to Pharaoh the meaning of his troubling dream. And Joseph had the power and ability, had he wanted to, he could have had his brothers flayed alive and tortured. He could have done the math and counted every slight that they had ever done against him. And instead, in a great foreshadowing of Jesus, our Savior and Lord, the son of the New Testament, Joseph, Old Testament Joseph says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. What a great, blessed, merciful expression of math. We have all of the totality of the sins of his brothers calculated up, and he's willing to blot it out with a divine eraser of forgiveness. In Romans 14, we have St. Paul encouraging us to look to the weaker brothers and to not count some of the things which they might do, which may or may not even enter the realm of sin, but not count them as important enough to break off fellowship with them or to cause division. And so instead of saying, oh, he's a vegetarian, or oh, he eats meat sacrificed to idols, to rejoice that all of our sins are blotted out by the Lord who loves us. And in the greatest exhibition of math in the scripture lessons for today, we have the parable of the unmerciful servant in Matthew 18. And here we have Peter doing the math, and the math of his day says that if you're going to be a genuinely authentic believer and somebody sins against you not just once or twice but even three times you should forgive him up to the third time so peter does a little quick math maybe from his fishing business he learned how to multiply and he multiplies that good goal of being willing to forgive three times and he doubles it plus one what a guy so he says, Lord, if someone sin sins against me even seven times, pretty high number. I've done the math. Three times is what our society kind of holds up as an ideal. How about seven times? Whew. Pretty good stuff. And Jesus says, and here are the translations and the texts are a little... Um, variable. If you look to those asterisks, you'll see Jesus replies, I tell you, not only seven times, but 70 times seven, or as our text says, 77 times. Whatever the actual inspiration of the Holy Spirit is, and I tend to think it's 490 rather than just 77, but that's just me. We have a lavish amount of forgiveness that Christ offers to us 
and by extension would have us offer to the world. You see, Jesus, as the son of the New Testament Joseph, doesn't just forgive his band of brothers who decide to have him sold off, first killed, but then sold off into slavery. Jesus is willing to forgive the sins of all people of all time by accepting them into his body on the cross so that our sins would not be counted against us. And he comes up with this absolutely wonderful parable that hits every single one of us pompous sinners right in the heart. Unless we use our Teflon shields and get those up and say, yeah, this applies to the person sitting to the right of me or to the left of me in the pews or perhaps behind me or off in the internet world, but it doesn't apply particularly to me except Jesus used it to illustrate each and every one of us and our human fallen nature's temptation to want God to do special math for us, canceling out and blotting out all of our sins, but our wanting to hang on to those much smaller numbers of real and imagined slights and offenses that we count that other people may have done to us. So Jesus tells this wonderful story of a master and a slave or a bond servant, and the master is calling a reckoning. And he says, you owe me 10,000 talents, pay up. 10,000 talents, is it silver, is it gold? It's a vast amount of money which a bond slave could possibly earn if it's talents of silver before silver prices went up and we go back and do the reckoning could only be 10 to 15,000 years worth of labor if it's 10,000 talents of gold and gold is up to $1,900 an ounce and we go back we could say this could be over a hundred thousand years worth of bond servant labor and yet the servant throws himself down in humility and begs his master, be patient and I will pay you all. A lie. My sister sometimes calls that exagger lying as if any of us could repay to the Lord all of the sins of thought and word and deed that we've done by misusing his name, the name into which we've been baptized and dragging it through the mud with our behavior by insulting all of the neighbors that we are supposed to be loving as ourselves, our family members and extended family members. Every sin we've ever done in our lives has not only been a sin against that person, that person, that person that God brought into my life, but also against God as well. 100,000 years, wouldn't be enough time for us to scrub our record clean. And God does the math. And the master in the story is first of a mind to not only throw that bond servant into jail until he pays all, but also to sell off his wife and family and extended family. And all of us have these relationships where the consequences of our sin and our evil and our debts impact others that we care about. And in a great act of mercy, the King, the Lord says, I'll cancel your debt. 100,000 plus years of slavish servitude wiped out in an instant and you would think this servant would be the happiest man in the world, and perhaps he was for a nanosecond. And then he does the math and he says, okay, I've now got that debt taken care of. 
I can go and I remember my fellow servant owes me a hundred denarii, hundred days labor. Much smaller debt could be paid off within three and a half months of labor. And he grabs his fellow servant by the neck and the fellow servant says exactly the same words. Patience, give me time and I will pay you all. And now this is a much more resolvable debt and yet the unmerciful servant chooses to throw his fellow servant into prison. And this doesn't go over very well with the spectators and the fellow bond servants or slaves of the master. And word gets back to the master and he hauls back the unmerciful servant and he says, because of your not really getting it, because you added up a hundred thousand plus years of mercy and compared it to a hundred days worth of labor and didn't appreciate the great gift I was giving to you, I am handing you over, and this translation unfortunately says jailers, the Greek word is actually punishers or torturers, and one of the ways that people were encouraged to pay their debts was by being tortured, and then all of their relatives and anybody that had any kind of feeling for them at all would pool their resources and try to pay off their debts so that they get out of prison. I will hand you over to the torturers, the punishers, until you have paid the last penny. Now, you and I like to think of ourselves as wonderful folks. Occasionally we'll sing that hymn, Chief of Sinners Though I Be, and my bishop on Vicarage used to quip, Chief of Sinners Though I Be, there are others worse than me, and that's our sinful, hypocritical nature with our faulty sinful math in the background because we really like to keep track of other people's sins against us. We like to add them up. We're not very eager to look at the record of our offenses against God. And yet what God is willing to do for you and for me and for all people is to nail our sins in the body of his son on the cross, to hand him over to the torturers so that he pays the absolute entire sin-guilt penalty for all people for all time, and offers to make that great exchange so that Christ's forgiveness applies to us. And this is where it's even better than the parable because in the parable the master, the Lord, the king still remembers the debt even though he says he's forgiven it and he can recall it at any time. But our sins God remembers no more. And as the beautiful psalm that we had for today says, I will separate your sins as far from you as the east is from the west. An infinity of separation by God's grace. My fuzzy math sometimes is bewildering to my spouse as she's balancing our checkbook. But God's great and gracious math is available to you and to me and to all who trust in him. We hate the math as we look at Jesus' gross estimate of our sinfulness as a hundred thousand plus years of slavish servitude to him and that not even really paying things off. And none of us live a hundred thousand years, not even Methuselah or Jared in the Old Testament. So we hate that huge number of sins that are charged against us. 
until God turns the mathematical light bulb of grace on and we understand that Jesus absorbed all of those sins in his body on the cross. He was willing to forgive us and in Matthew, Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer, the Greek word is forgive us our debts, tying in with this parable, as we forgive our debtors. St. Paul would say God's great and precious, gracious math of forgiveness of all of our sins should be so great that we not only forgive the sins of those who've sinned against us, but we take their weaknesses into account as well. And in Romans 14, he urges us to rein in our Christian freedom so that we don't risk offending brothers and sisters in the Christ who don't see perfectly eye to eye with us on all things. You and I hate the math of God's counting up every single one of our sins and seeing the enormity of it right up until we love our Savior as he gifts us with genuine saving faith and we see how much we have been forgiven all of those debts hundred thousand plus years of sin and then through the power of the Holy Spirit you and I get the opportunity to share the wealth of God's grace with our world by forgiving others as God's forgiven merciful servants in the name of Jesus the most perfect servant of all Amen now may the peace of God, which is beyond all human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please join me as we confess the faith that saves in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified who spoke by the prophets and I believe one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We pray. O oh, Almighty God, our sinful memories tabulate, record, and sometimes even multiply every slight, insult, sin, and supposed disrespect we have suffered at the hands of others. And sometimes, like Adam, we even blame you for evils and tag you corruptly. Your law accurately convicts us of all our sin, and your gospel mercifully punishes Jesus in our place. Help us see that every sin we have ever committed against our families, neighbors, and even creation have also chiefly been sins against you. Empower us to treasure your absolution and share forgiveness with those who have sinned against us. Graciously transform us into your merciful servants. Even as we recall the national tragedy on September 11th, you call us to pray for our enemies. We pray for your justice to rule in our world for the sake of the gospel and for our enemies to repent of their sins and trust in Christ 
before they suffer the temporal consequences of their actions. Murder and hatred run amuck through our land. Sin is celebrated and everyone does what is right in his or her own eyes. Help us dive into your word that we may know your law and the blessed soul-saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Renew the fear of God in our land and end the murders and violence in Chicago and the lawlessness across our country. Protect our world from racism, violence, disease, and anti-Christian extremism, especially in Africa and the Middle East. Send your holy angels to watch over our military and our first responders. Lead Islamic terrorists to see you and Jesus for who you really are and trust in you. According to your will, remove the virus, panic, and discord from our land and give us patience as you work even this pandemic for the good of all who love you. We thank you for giving us the gift of prayer and teaching us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen.